Well, the teaching team of The Way has given me the privilege and the joy of launching our new series of messages entitled Signs of Glory. In this series, we're going to be looking at seven mighty deeds performed by Jesus of Nazareth, witnessed firsthand by the Apostle John, one of Jesus' closest friends, and then recorded by John in his gospel. As we will see, the seven mighty deeds are miracles of high order. But John does not call them miracles. They are. They are miracles. But John does not call them miracles. He calls them signs. Why? Sign is a technical term in the Bible referring to deeds which point beyond themselves to a much greater reality than the deeds themselves. The seven signs John records are pointing to what John refers to as glory. Now, John knows that Jesus did many more than seven signs of glory. As he says toward the conclusion of his gospel, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John chooses the seven he records because in his mind, they uniquely manifest glory. And as he describes these seven signs, he prays that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that in believing, you might have life in his name. So I invite you now to come with me into the story of the first sign recorded in the second chapter of John, verses 1 through 11. We don't always do what I'm going to ask you to do, but it seemed like a, a good thing to do today. Would you please stand? for the reading of the gospel. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana, Cana of Galilee. Cana of Galilee is just down the road from Nazareth where Jesus was raised. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother says to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. These are, these are big jars. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink but you have served the best until now. This, the beginning of his signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Spirit of the living God, we believe that you enable John to remember this event and then accurately record it for us. I pray now in your mercy and grace that you would take us beyond these words into the very reality of which they speak as never before, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. This, the beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Literally, it is, his disciples believed into him. The preposition John uses implies motion. Believe in is too static a translation. Believe into 
paints the picture of disciples doing something. They're moving toward Jesus. They're moving into Jesus. They're leaning into Jesus, the language that Jason uses. They see Jesus' glory and they press into him. Turning water into wine is the first of the signs of glory John records. The others are healing a royal official's son who was sick and at the point of death, recorded in chapter 4. Healing a man who had been lame for 38 years, recorded in chapter 5. Multiplying five loaves of of bread and two fish to feed 5,000 men plus their women and children with 12 baskets of leftovers chapter 6, walking on water during a violent storm, also chapter 6, giving sight to a man who had been born blind, chapter 9, and bringing a man named Lazarus back to life after being in a tomb for four days, chapter 11. The first sign, turning water into wine, is the most miraculous of them all. The most miraculous deed ever done by Jesus of Nazareth, surpassed only by the deed done to him after his crucifixion when he was resurrected from the grave. Turning water into wine, his most miraculous sign, I will show you why in a few moments. Now, what is John wanting us to know in the way he tells the story of the first sign? Jesus manifested his glory. Well, step back from the Cana story for a moment and see it in light of the whole of John's gospel. John first uses this word glory in his poetic introduction to the gospel in what is called the prologue, in what is better called the overture to the story of Jesus' life and ministry, death and resurrection. Now, here is how John opens up the whole of his gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Literally, it is toward God, face to face. The Word was toward God, face to face, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through him. Then chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally, he pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory. John 1, 14, it's the theme verse of the whole of the gospel, and we beheld his glory. Now, big question. Why does John announce the most significant event in the history of the world? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The maker of all things became human. And then say, and we beheld his glory. Why not say, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and God and humanity were reconciled. Reconciliation is one of the great implications of the enfleshment of God, of the incarnation of the word, is it not? Why not emphasize it? Why does John not say the word became flesh and dwelt among us and the rule of Satan was broken? That too is an implication of the incarnation. Why not emphasize it? Or why not say the word became flesh and dwelt among us and the power of sin and death were broken? Praise God. That too is one of the implications of the Son of God taking on our flesh. Why not emphasize it? Why emphasize glory? Why and we beheld his glory? Because John the evangelist, John the theologian, John the pastor is always taking us deeper. We beheld his glory. John emphasizes that implications of Jesus coming into the world because John believes beholding glory is our greatest human need. Let me say that again. John emphasizes we beheld his glory because beholding glory is our greatest human need. It is? Yes, it is. Now, how do we know this? Step back further from the Cana story and see it in light of the larger story the Bible is telling. In particular, go all the way back to Moses. Moses of the great exodus from Egypt. 
Moses, the 80-year-old man whom God chose to lead one of the greatest liberation movements in history. Now, why go back to Moses? John himself takes us there in his prologue. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, and then goes on in chapter one, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Why go back to Moses in emphasizing glory? Because Moses is the human being who most powerfully expresses our need. On the top of a mountain in the desert, Called, uh, the mountain called Sinai, he first receives the Ten Commandments. And then later on the same mountain, he cries out, show me your glory. The story is told in Exodus 33. Moses is engaged in this intense conversation with the living God. And right in the middle of it, Moses cries out, show me your glory. Exodus 33, 18. Show me your glory. It's a bold request. One of the boldest any human being can make. Show me your glory. Now, what we need to realize is that when Moses prays, show me your glory, he has everything. When he prays, show me your glory, Moses has everything we human beings think we need in order to be whole. He has everything. Moses already has all his basic needs met. Water miraculously flowing from rocks Manna spread on the ground every morning. uh, 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 Quail, that's the word. Quail galore uh, every evening. Moses has quality relationships. He's married. He has children. He's working closely with his brother and sister. He already has guidance. He has the Ten Commandments and a host of other ordinances. He's been given this cloud to guide him by day and a pillar of fire to guide him by night. Moses already has meaningful responsibilities, probably more than he wants. He's been called to lead hundreds of thousands of people across a barren desert to a land flowing with milk and honey. He already has freedom. He and his people have been liberated from 400 years of economic and political oppression. He already has hope without which we cannot live. He's been given the promise of a better life for him and his people. The list goes on and on. Moses already has security. He's experiencing the very presence of the living God. Moses knows God is there with him and for him. Moses already has all the fame any human being would ever want. He's just led one of the greatest revolutions the world has ever known, ever. Moses has it all. Everything we need, that we think we need in order to be whole, provision, relationships, guidance, meaningful work, freedom, hope, security, and fame, yet it is not enough. Moses is not satisfied, and so he cries out, show me your glory. Glory. The New Testament word is doxa. It comes into the English language in words like doxology. Doxa, logos, a word about glory. The Old Testament word is the word kavod. I don't think it comes into any English word I know except in the name ik kavod, which means like, where's the glory? You don't want to be named ik kavod. Where is the glory? The words doxa and kavod have three meanings or three nuances. The first is luminosity. Thus, the phrase in the Christmas story is told by Luke, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Luminosity. Luminosity that dispels darkness. Luminosity that breaks through and overcomes the darkness. Which is why, like Moses, when we behold glory, our countenance changes. Our eyes and our face will reflect back the luminosity. The second nuance is weightiness. The basic meaning of the word kavod is weighty. Kavod is the heaviness of a thing. Gravitas might be another way to put it. Glory is heavy. Now, we experience these two nuances when ordinary light falls on our eyes. There's both luminosity and weightiness. When someone flips the light on in the morning, we experience both brightness and heaviness. When, therefore, doxa and kavod are used of the living God, they are referring to the weightiness 
of God's luminous presence. The third nuance of the word is most critical to grasp. Glory is the way of saying essence. The doxa of a thing is its essence. The kavod of a thing is its essence. An essence that shines forth with inherent weightiness. Moses' prayer, show me your glory, is therefore a prayer that God reveal God's essence. Wow. It's a prayer that God reveal what it is that makes God be God. Show me your glory. Which is why when the Hebrew Bible is translated into Greek, the translators render Moses' prayer, show me yourself. Pull back the curtain that surrounds your very essence and show me who and what you are. You have made that request many times. You may not have used Moses' exact words, but you've prayed this many times. For it is our greatest human longing and need. It is the deepest inarticulate groaning of the human soul. Moses wants to see beauty beyond all beauty. Moses wants to see radiance beyond all radiancy. Moses wants to see the splendor beyond all splendor. So do I and so do you. Moses wants to see majesty beyond all majesty. He wants to see purity beyond all purity. He wants to see goodness beyond all goodness. He wants to see love beyond all love. So do I and so do you. Moses is grateful as I am and as are you for all the snatches of glory around us, like the changing colors of autumn or like the spectacular images of deep space captured by the Webb telescope or like neuroplasticity. (laughs) But Moses knows, as I do and as you do, that he will not be satisfied until we see glory itself. We will not be satisfied until we see glory himself. And the Word, God the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Do you hear what John is declaring? Do you see what he's wanting us to realize? In the eternal Word taken on our flesh, the living God is meeting the greatest longing of a human heart. God is answering Moses' prayer. He's answering your prayer. He is meeting our need to behold the luminous, weighty essence of God. Jesus of Nazareth is glory in our flesh. He is glory within the confines of our humanity. He's the radiance of God's glory, says the writer of the book of Hebrews. He's the visible expression of the living God, says the apostle Paul. Veiled in flesh the Godhead sees, sings Charles Wesley. He dwelt among us. John here is choosing his words very carefully. Dwelt. The word literally means tabernacled or pitch a tent. And in using that word, John is taking us back to the supreme place where glory was manifested in the Bible before the coming of Jesus. He's taking us back to the so-called tent of meeting. It was there that the cloud would descend. It was there that fire would shine. And so real and so palpable was it all that on one occasion, Moses was unable to enter into the tent. It was so filled with weighty luminosity, as the text puts it. The same thing happened in the temple that was built by Solomon. On the day of dedication, the glory was so palpable that the priests were unable to stand. They had had fall to their knees before the radiance of the heaviness of the glory, as the text puts it. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent into our, in our midst. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Or as Eugene Peterson renders it, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And we beheld his glory. Ah! Jesus is the new tent of meeting. 
Jesus is the new tabernacle. Jesus is the new temple. More than that, he is doxa made flesh. He is kavod made flesh. He is glory come in such a way that we need not, like Moses, hide in the cleft of a rock to protect ourselves. He is glory come in such a way that we can look and not be afraid. He is glory come in such a way that we can look and be transformed. In every deed Jesus does, in every word Jesus speaks, we are beholding the very essence of the luminous, weighty God. (laughs) Should I go on? (laughs) John makes this clear in the way he organizes his gospel. The whole book is built around the word glory. After the introductory chapter, John gathers up in chapters 2 through 11, seven signs of glory. And these chapters are bracketed by the word glory. In chapter 2, after Jesus performs the first great sign, turning water into wine, John writes, so Jesus manifested his glory. Then in chapter 11, just before the seventh great sign, raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus says, did I not say to you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? And then in chapter 12, as Jesus heads toward his crucifixion, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Father, glorify your name. And then we enter into Holy Week, into what John Calvin calls the theater of glory. Okay, in light of all of that now, let's go back to the wedding in Cana of Galilee. John says at the end of that story, Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed into him. They beheld glory and they could not but move toward him. So another big question. What about the glory of God is Jesus manifesting at that wedding? What about the luminous, weighty essence of the living God are the disciples witnessing? According to John, This was the first public event of Jesus' public ministry, which means that Jesus is launching his ministry at a wedding. (laughs) Why at a wedding? Why not at a worship service in the temple? Or why not at a protest rally at the headquarters of of, uh, Pilate? He begins at a wedding in part to say that if we get this relationship right, the rest of society can fall into place. He comes to make marriage work. Whatever it is that makes God be God stands behind marriage. Glory comes to empower marriage. Over my years of pastoral ministry, I've performed hundreds of weddings, probably 400. And I can testify that he has shown up at all of them. (laughs) It's wonderful to witness. Glory shows up at a wedding to bless. The luminous, weighty essence of God shows up to bless. Which is why I do a wedding and I can't help but keep smiling. (laughs) And he begins his public ministry at a wedding to also signal where his ministry in and for the world is ultimately leading. Get this. It's all headed, it's all headed to a relationship with glory that can only finally be described in terms of the intimacy of marriage. He comes to love us in a way analogous to the love between a bride and a groom. He comes to love us in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, for better or for worse, as long as we both shall live. John will, many years later, in the last book of the Bible, even describe the city of God to which, to, toward which history is moving as the bride of Jesus. In the meantime, the Apostle Paul will describe the church as the bride of Christ. Glory seeks deep, deep deep intimacy with us. At this particular wedding, the wine runs out. A huge social crisis with huge financial implications. Jesus' mother comes to him. They have no wine, she says to him. Presumably, she was friends with the bride and groom being married that day. She may have even been a close relative. And she's worried that running out of wine is going to cause the couple to experience terrible shame. They have no wine. 
John does not tell us what Mary had in mind when she says this to Jesus. But even at that point, she knew that he could do something. She already knew that Jesus is wonderfully resourceful. Jesus replies, woman, what do I have to do with you? That sounds rude, but it is not. (laughs) It's not. He's just making it clear that as much as he loves us, he cannot be told what to do. We cannot demand that glory does what we want him to do. And we see this in the fact that he does not call his mother, mother. (laughs) If she wants his help now, she will not get it simply on the basis of a son and mother relationship. She cannot make that kind of claim on him. Only his father can do that. My hour has not yet come, says Jesus. Trace that phrase through the Gospel of John, and you discover that the hour is the time when he lays down his life for the life of the world. That will be the great hour of glory. That will be the moment when Jesus finally manifests the fullness of glory. And at the wedding, that had not yet come. For now, the point being that in Cana, we are told that glory cannot be boxed in, even by his earthly mother. Mary accepts his reply. She turns to the servants and says, whatever he says to do, do it. Mary is rightly honored in the, in the Christian church, but I think she would be troubled by the, some of the ways she's honored. <laughs> as almost if she's a co-ruler with Jesus. But it is clear in Scripture she knows her place because Mary's posture is one of always pointing to her son. Whatever he says to do, do it. Is this not the role of parenting and grandparenting? Saying to our children and grandchildren, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. And is this not the role we disciples have with one another? To say to one another, whatever Jesus says to do, like do it. Then comes the moment of the manifestation of glory. John tells us there are six water pots present in the room. They're there for the Jewish custom of purification, he says. They're used... They're therefore uh, using in various rituals that were designed to bring about cleansing. Not just cleansing for the body, but for the soul. But were those rituals successful? I think John is hinting that they were not. Fill the water pots with water, Jesus says to the servants. What? With water? I can imagine the servant saying, Jesus, we don't need more water. We need wine. Why do you want to fill these pots with water? But when they do what Jesus says to do, they and we discover what glory can do. The water becomes wine. A massively creative miracle. Simply by speaking, six Water pots of stagnant water become six water pots of the finest of wine. When the master of ceremony tastes the wine, he's blown away by its quality. Now notice that John calls Jesus' action at the wedding the beginning of signs. Chapter 2, verse 11, the beginning of signs. And the word that's used here is the word archaic. It comes into the English language in words like archetype and architecture. Now, archaic does mean beginning as first in the sequence. Turning water into wine is the first in the sequence of the seven signs. But archaic primarily means beginning as the source of the sequence, beginning as primal or archetypal, beginning as representative of all that is to come, meaning that Jesus' mighty deed at Cana pictures everything else he's going to do. Turning water into wine is a picture of the whole of Jesus' action in the world. Now, a moment ago, I used the words massively creative miracle. In fact, I said the most massively creative miracle he ever performed. What justifies me saying that? A simple fact. You ready? No grapes. Jesus doesn't ask for grapes. He does not say, 
go pick some ripe, ripe grapes and crush them into the water pots. He just says, fill the water pots with water. The water becomes wine without any grapes. Which means, catch this, that the ingredients for the wine are not in the water pots. Just water. Nothing in the water would ever be turned into wine. No circumstance, given all the time in the world, would the water in the stone jars ever become wine. The ingredients for wine are not in the water. It's just H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. There's no ethanol or glycanol or flavanol or malic or citric acid. Just water. Now, I preached on this first sign for an evening service for the way about a year ago when we were meeting at Fairview Baptist. Some of you might have been there. And I cited the commentary on this story by St. Augustine of the third century, one of the church's greatest theologians, if not the greatest. And Augustine said that the creator is always turning water into wine. It's just that he does it through a slow, natural process. At Cana, says Augustine, the creator, become one of us, speeds up the natural process. In early years of ministry, when I would teach on the water into wine story, I I would go with Augustine. I thought it was a cool way to interpret the miracle in a way that would not offend my and other scientific sensibilities. At Cana, the creator who is always turning water into wine simply speeded up the natural process. Cool, no? But about 25 years ago, I realized that Augustine missed the point. Sounds a bit audacious for me (laughs) to say that one of history's greatest theologians missed the point, but may I humbly say it anyway, he did, he missed the point. He missed the point on two counts. First, the creator is not always turning water into wine through a slow, natural process. The creator is always turning water and grapes into wine through a slow, natural process. But he's not always turning water alone into wine. Augustine would not say the creator is always turning water into milk, would he? No, the ingredients for milk are not in water. Water is needed for milk as for wine, but the ingredients for the milk and the wine are not in the water. And second, at Cana, Jesus is not speeding up a natural process. Speed's not the issue. He's doing something never done before. He's bringing into being what was not there in the jars. He's bringing into being something brand new. Without the grapes, he's making the wine. Do you see this? You may not believe that what John claimed happened actually happened, but do you see what John is claiming happened? Just water, no grapes. He turns the water into vintage wine without grapes. Jesus manifested his glory. Glory is gloriously creative. Jesus is manifesting the very essence of the living God, gloriously creative. Jesus is manifesting himself as gloriously creative. Jesus does not need grapes to make wine. Out of water without grapes, he speaks forth delicious wine. My hour has not yet come. But when it does, something like what happened at Cana will happen. I think that's what Jesus is getting at. My hour has not yet come. But when it does, something like what you see in water becoming wine without grapes will happen. And it did on Easter morning. Out of death, Jesus brings forth life. Out of the crucified, dead body of the man from Galilee, Glory brings forth the resurrected body of the resurrected Lord of the universe. Out of death comes the new human who cannot die. Glory. Now, this is why we're doing this series on the signs of glory. In these very troubling, unsettling times, we can feel very overwhelmed, disoriented, discouraged, and depressed. Understandably so. I don't think I've ever felt as disoriented in all of my life as I have over the past few years. Especially if all we behold is all the stuff that keeps coming at us. 
But when we behold glory, when we look at glory, hope begins to rise in our souls. Jesus, glory himself, can do things no one else can do. Jesus, glory himself, can do things no one ever dreamed of doing. And if you get close to Jesus, very creative things start taking place in your life. Amen. And here's the wonder, and we're coming to the conclusion. Here's the wonder. The ingredients for the very creative things do not have to be there for Jesus to do the very creative things. Should I say that again? The ingredients for the very creative things do not have to be there for Jesus to do the gr- very creative things. The grapes do not have to be there. Now, one of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John takes place in the chapter just before the Cana story. Jesus makes a life-transforming promise to a fisherman who is now known as Simon Peter. But when Jesus first meets him, he's only Simon. Simon is brought to Jesus by his brother Andrew. John says Jesus looked at Simon. The verb means he looked into Simon. (laughs) Like Jesus does with all of us. (laughs) Into his very being. And Jesus says, you are Simon, but you shall be called Cephas. Or Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic, Peter is the, is the Greek. Now, the name Simon is related to the verb which means either shifting sand or blowing in the wind. <laughs> Unstable, unreliable. The name Cephas means rock. Peter means rock. Jesus promises, I will make you shifting sand into solid rock. And here's the wonder. Here's the wonder. The ingredients for rockness were not there in Simon. And they don't need to be there. Because when Jesus promises to do a new work in us, the ingredients for the new work do not need to be there. The grapes do not need there be there for Jesus to make wine. So when Jesus promises to make us a people of hope, the ingredients for hope do not need to be there. When Jesus promises to make us a people of courage, the ingredients for courage do not need to be there. When Jesus promises to make us a people who love, the ingredients for love do not have to be there. When Jesus promises to make us a people of patience, the ingredients for patience do not need to be there. Should I go on? When Jesus promises to work self-control in our souls, the ingredients for self-control do not need to be there. That's hope in the face of addiction. The ingredients for the self-control do not need to be there for him to work self-control in us. And here's the great story. When Jesus promises to make, promises to make us holy, the ingredients for holiness do not need to be there. He can do it without the grapes. He manifested his glory, his very essence. He is gloriously creative. This is the time you're supposed to say hallelujah. (laughs) Now, do we have a role to play in this? Yes, we do. We've already seen it as we review the story. We invite Jesus into the circumstances of our life. Simple as that. John seems to emphasize this. Jesus was invited to the wedding. Someone called Jesus to the party. Someone went out of their way to call Jesus to the occasion. And as a friend of mine likes to say, Jesus always goes where he is invited. So do it. Today. Tomorrow. Every day this week, wherever you go. Invite Jesus into the spheres and relationships of our lives. And then, do whatever he says to do. However unrelated it seems to be to your need. However seemingly simplistic or challenging. Again, Mary said to the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. And watch what starts to happen. Oh, great I am. Show me your glory. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And one day, 
He was invited to a wedding in Galilee where, without any fanfare, Jesus manifested the luminous, weighty presence and essence of the living God. And the disciples believed into him and they began to live a life they never thought was possible. 